teacher. Um, so some of you have probably heard that we have a high school prayer class, and uh, so that's kind of where I'm going with my story and how I was kind of called into doing that, because most of you know um, my heart's beating out of my chest and I'm sweating buckets right now because there's a whole lot of you in here. So this is not what I do. That's why I sit behind a desk, close behind a door most of the time. So bear with me as I kind of go off my notes and try not to stumble over my words. Um, so yeah, so um, as we were preparing for kind of the Advent um, season and kind of talking about um, the theme that we were going with, um, and then Mark asked me to speak today, uh, I started kind of thinking about what hope meant through the prayer class ministry. And so when I really started kind of putting that together, um, it really started with a calling. Um, so we, we have a hope uh, that we have in being called by God to do something for his, for his work, for his ministry. So kind of the backstory of kind of how this all started. Um, one evening, I was joined with some of my uh, gal pals that I pray with, um, and we were out here at the church. We usually try to come out every so often. There are ladies that I do life with, and uh, we had gone through a study on the Lord's Prayer. And um, I was encouraged by the person who taught me how to pray to kind of lead my group of ladies in um, how to pray, not just studying the Lord's Prayer, but how to implement prayer into our lives. And so um, that for me growing up as a Catholic was kind of a foreign concept because I was taught more to pray by reciting a prayer than it was actually a relationship with Christ and just coming up with my own words to pray. And of course, praying out loud was like, uh, no, you don't do that. You sit and you pray quietly. So the concept was pretty foreign to me. Um, so kind of after going through that study and gradually implementing with my lady friends um, how the how part of prayer, um, the youngest one in our group, she's about in her mid-30s, um, shared with us, she kind of had a similar background to me. She grew up Catholic. And so she had never really known how to pray, you know, this concept of talking and praying out loud to Jesus was just something that she really struggled with. And so, you know, the group of women that we were doing life with, it was a process for all of us, but for her, it kind of really resonated with me because we had a very similar story. She was very insecure, um, felt very inadequate about um, how to even begin to pray. And so, you know, at that point, that night at the church, um, she had moved so far into her prayer life. She was writing her prayers down. She was praying out loud with us, and she just felt so overwhelmingly blessed to have made that step in her life. And so um, praying out loud again was something that was just, it, it's hard for all of us to do, but seeing and hearing her story and it having it reminisce to being my story really meant a lot. And so I was uh, reassured her, you know, that all of us have been there. We've all been at that point at some place in our life that prayer has been a stumbling block. It's been something maybe that we haven't truly understood how to do. And we kind of use the excuse that it's, it's hard, so we just don't do it as often as we should. And so after we left, um, this one question in the car, almost as soon as I got outside, kind of popped into my head of how can she or I, or maybe any of you, be the age that we are and never have learned how to pray. And at that point, God spoke to me from the time I left here until I got home. And he pretty much laid out the complete plan of what's become the high school prayer class. Um, so he, he truly called me for his purpose. He laid it out, and I mean, every class, every subject, it's like he just painted that picture in my head in that 30-minute car ride home. And so he was calling me to have hope in him by leading me through his calling. And so most of you that do know me, I'm not a fly-by-the-seat-of-my-pants person. I do not jump into anything. It's very fact-finding, and I spent a lot of time making a decision. So the next day, I went into Mark, and I was just like, okay, here's what we're doing. <laughs> Hope you like the idea, because mm -hmm. this is what God said I needed to do, and 
again, it surprised me, and I think it maybe even <coughs> surprised him a little bit because he knows me, and it's just like, okay, uh, let's do this then. So when God calls us, what follows is the hope that we have in being obedient because we have a choice when he calls us. We can either ignore him or we can act in obedience and follow him. And so that's what happened with me was just following in obedience. And so when he laid out that high school prayer class, you know, he answered my questions by bringing the teaching back several generations because if I was a 30, 40 something and didn't know how to pray, how were we gonna change the culture? How were we gonna make a change to integrate that to where people weren't in my position in their mid 30s or 40s or older or whatever not knowing how to pray and so he laid the foundation that would equip these guys right here into adulthood giving them hope that they could turn to Christ without feeling insecure or inadequate so what comes after being called by God is being obedient and God laid out his plan which for the high school prayer class is a six-week class the first class we focus on just understanding what prayer is and then the five weeks after that we have a cool acronym yeah logan's got his keychain it's party um so the acronym is p is praise a is admit r is request t is thanks and y is yield and so we have a fun acronym that helps them understand the parts of prayer and we take a six-week class um, we're not out here very long. Um, well, I say not very long. It depends on how long these guys are in prayer because sometimes there's laughter, sometimes there's tears. Um, most so of the time there's tears. Most of the times there's tears, yes, very true, very true. Um, so we structure the class to where we do the teaching part in the pastor study. And then with each week, we're building a, excuse me, building upon a piece of prayer and we come out here and we get on our knees or lay down, whatever the kids want to do, and then they break off in groups and they pray. And so out of obedience, the hope that I'm filled with is teaching these youth um, how to have a deeper relationship with Christ through prayer. And so once we're called by God, following, uh, followed by our obedience to him, what comes next is the expression of hope that I have in his blessing. And so um, I, I can't really explain to you um, the feeling that I get. Um, there's 27 kids that have been through this class. I wasn't gonna get emotional, but when I'm nervous, I get emotional. Um, you know, they've made some incredible headway in their lives. And being out here, when you can, all you can hear is just their whispers. You can't hear their prayers. But when you're on your knees and they're spread out throughout the sanctuary, it's incredible, absolutely incredible. And so um, I encourage any of you high school kids that haven't taken it, you need to do it. But anyways, um, but the blessing that comes from this is the hope. Um, it's hope that these students connect with Christ. Um, it's hope that they share what prayer is with their peers. Um, there are several of these guys that They've come, we've had three classes so far. We usually do a fall and a spring. But it's amazing how some of these kids have actually turned into the prayer mentor and are bringing kids in and actually helping teach them how to pray. So, you know, hope is that this will be with them well into adulthood um, whenever they go through something very joyful or even tragedy um, that they can call back on this and enter into prayer with God and seek Jesus and hope that they can ultimately pass this on to their own children one day. And, uh, you know, it's, again, God really laid it on my heart to change the culture of our churches because it all really starts with prayer. And a church that's built on prayer can do an incredible amount of things for Christ. Um, so, again, my continued hope, and I hope theirs, is ultimately in Jesus. Um, my hope is that he called me to do something very unlike my nature. Um, and that he continues to give me the encouragement that I need to get up and talk to these guys um, every so often for six weeks at a time. Um, I don't just throw something together, you know, in a night. And, you know, again, this was very outside of my, my box. But my hope is that through my obedience in Christ that these students are 
going to change the culture. They're going to do things that are just going to rock the foundation of our church and bringing it back down again, like I said, to the principle of prayer. Um, so my hope is that you as a church listen to God's calling because if he's calling you, he's going to do something absolutely amazing if you listen. And um, if he places it on your heart, he's, he's got something planned for you. So just be willing to listen when he calls you and then make the choice to act in obedience. So Yeah, for sure. Thank you so much for sharing that with us. You know, I uh, after you shared with me what you were going to say, I, in reading this verse, I was just like, man, that is like exactly what this verse is talking about, that God has filled you with so much joy. Just the seeing, and I agree, when we're out here and all these kids are out here praying, and it it's just fills your heart with so much joy. Um, and the fact that you did that in believing and, and took that step of faith in believing that this is not normal for me, but I'm going to do it anyway because I believe you called me to do this. And so just, you know, the God of hope fills us with so much joy because you stepped out in believing. Uh, I, it's, it's incredible. And I'll just say this too, just, um, just so everybody knows how, how incredible we are blessed here at this church because God is doing so many amazing things through our church that it, it, sometimes it's hard and, and a lot of you might miss it uh, because you don't know some of what's going on. But it, there is, we, we are so incredibly blessed here with, with volunteers and with people who help out with youth. And I am so grateful and thankful for everyone, everybody that has helped out with youth in some way or another. It just God is such, he, he's moving and he's doing so many great things through your um, not necessarily through me, but through volunteers, through other people who are wanting to share this joy and this peace with others, like Stephanie. And just to give you an idea of how crazy this is, like th it's mind blowing that on a on a church, an average church size of 300, you're lucky to get about 10 percent, about 30 people to help with youth ministry from nursery through high school. You're lucky to get about 10 percent, about 30 on an average church, about 300. And, and I checked it this week, the, the number, just because I was, I was thinking about this. I'm like, man, this is incredible. That we have, uh, my last count, we have 78 volunteers from nursery through high school. Uh, so 20, 26% rather than 10. Like, God is doing just incredible things. And I don't say that as a word of pride or boasting. It's not because of me. It's, it's because of what God is doing and God is calling you. And you guys are stepping out in faith and following and and helping serve and lead these kids, and, and it's just incredible to see. It's incredible to be a part of. I have a, I have a sign in my office that I, I look at every single day that's taped up on my window um, that, that says, do, I exist to, uh, do my volunteers exist to serve my team, or do I exist to serve my volunteers team? Uh, because it's not about me. It's, it's about the volunteers. It's about those who are willing to step up and follow God's calling and leading uh, and doing incredible things. And it's just mind-blowing how God is working and moving in our church. So thank you. And I, and I also don't say that as a call, you know, as a word to give you an excuse not to help. Because we have 78 volunteers. We still need more. Uh, we can still always use more. Um, but it's just incredible to see what God is doing here through our youth. Um, it, it really is a blessing to have amazing volunteers like you guys, especially like with Stephanie too, who are, who are willing to step out and do that. And so uh, with that being said, I want to have Hannah share her story uh, because God has really done some incredible things through her life as well. Uh, and, and her story is great, but there are so many other stories over here that, that you, could, you could ask them and, and see, you know, how has God worked and moved in your life? And they could tell you uh, exactly what he has done. So I wanted you to hear uh, from Hannah here. Okay, so um, I'm a junior in high school. And um, my sophomore year was like probably the roughest year of my life. Um, it, I started school and everything was going good. I was playing volleyball and um, I started like passing out and they couldn't figure out really why I was doing it. And after like endless amounts of like doctor's appointments, labs, like everything that they could do, they couldn't really find answers. And I um, had to wear a heart monitor for a month, which was like really hard for me. And it was like pulling me away from 
like my friends and everything that I love to do. And I wasn't able to do everything that all my other friends were doing because my parents were afraid that I was gonna like pass out and all this stuff. So um, I really started like isolating myself and I kept myself from, you know, adventuring and doing the things that I should be doing as a high school student. And I, the amount of days that I spent in my room crying just became more and more and more. And through those times, it was, I, I don't even know how many months, like it, it started in August and I think it wasn't until like January that we finally got some answers. But um, I became very depressed. And as a high school student, you, you know, you hear like, man, school just sucks. Life just sucks as a high schooler. Like, you know, it's typical for you to be just overwhelmed and stressed and just think that the whole world's after you. But for me, I just, even with my friends, I just felt like nothing was getting better and that everything just, it was one thing after the other, not just my sickness, but I was like losing friends because I didn't want to, I wasn't hanging out with them. And not only did I, I didn't want to, like, I was like, I'm just gonna sit in my room and be upset because I can't do the things that everybody else is doing. And it got to a point to where my friends kind of gave up and they weren't asking me if I was okay anymore. And it just, it got to me. And um, I, I don't tell very many people this. It's like only a few of my friends know, but I just feel like it's on my heart today to tell you guys because I hope that one day that my story could be shared and I could change some people's lives. But I became suicidal and I remember I was, that night I was like laying in my room and I like looked over at my picture wall and I saw like all of my friends and I was like, I can't do this. And I was like, there's so much more for me. And I got on my phone and the first thing I saw on my phone was on the Bible app and it was Romans 838. The first thing that I did when I picked up my phone after looking at that. And it says, and we know that God causes everything to work together for the good of those who love God and are called according to his purpose for them. And I knew at that moment that what I was going through was it, it wasn't the end for me, that there was so much more for me in this world, and that God has so much more planned for me. And I, I'd finally, I'd gotten to a point to where I could try and tell my parents, and I had gotten help, and um, I went to therapy, and through that journey, I it was crazy because it seemed like everything I looked at and everything I went towards was Jesus. Like, it wasn't, it wasn't me necessarily seeking him. It was him seeking me. Like, it would just seemed like he was just, he was telling me, like, Hannah, it's not your time. Don't go. Like, this is, I have so much more for you in life. And after I, you know, I finally was like, yes, okay, I accept you, God. This is, this is not then for me. This is, this is it. I, became closer with um, God and I became more involved in youth and I did everything I could to make sure that my relationship with him wasn't going to fade away anymore and it just it's been a blessing for me and I have my church friends who are my real like who are my outside friends and you know the church family and everybody was all so supported of me and I just I couldn't be any more blessed, and I'm just so glad that I was able to turn to a father that was so welcoming and so, like, perfect. Like, he's just there for you, and I just want everybody to know that, like, if you're going through this, that you're not alone and that he's there for you, even when other people are not. So that's how I found hope in Jesus. Thank you. Again, just, you know, thinking of your story and th thinking about this verse that in a world that was, it seemed 
chaotic and crazy and you don't know what's going on, you don't understand why this is happening, God gave you peace. He filled you with peace. Uh, and he does that with all of us. And, it, and it's, it's incredible to see the hope that we can get um, from God because he fills us with, he, I mean, he has an endless amount. And he can give us hope, and he can give us joy, and he can give us peace. And, um, and it's incredible to see, you know, how God has worked in your life and, uh, and through volunteers and, and just how God is working and moving through the lens of youth ministry. Even within our little, home, you know, church out in the middle of the country, in the middle of nowhere, um, he's alive and active, and uh, it's not just God doing things in other places. God's doing stuff here. Uh, and it's really, really cool to see and to be a part of. Um, you know, I, I, wish I, we, I wish we had time that I could tell you stories of, from things in youth ministry that fill me with joy and fill me with hope. Um, you know, because I've been in youth ministry now for 18 years, and there's so many stories that I could share with you. But, uh, you know, stories like of all the kids, all the students who have weeped and cried in my kitchen, in my living room, and just in our house, not because of shame of the sin that they've committed, but because of the forgiveness that they found because of Jesus, that they're just overwhelmed and weeping. Uh, you know, I could tell you stories of, of a college freshman boy that I got to talk with one time at, at midnight in a park, sitting on a park bench, and him telling me how, as a kid, he was, he was spiritually attacked, and he would hear voices of him telling him, to, to kill himself or to hurt these other people or to go to school and stab some kid or hearing, hearing voices telling him that he's, he's not worthless, that he's not good enough and he's worthless and, and that he should just give up. And uh, literally, he, he was sitting and telling me he's sitting in class and he's hearing these voices, uh, but that he overcame and, he, and he, he got through it and he fought because of the Bible, because of his relationship with God, that he remembered verses at that time. And I said, dude, that, that is a spiritual warfare. But I could... I mean, there's so many stories of, of, of students where, you know, where, and volunteers get this, that where, where you see their face change because, like, the light bulb clicks, and they get it, and they're like, huh, yeah, that makes sense. I want that. I, I, I understand that. I want that. Uh, you know, so many stories of that. Uh, one, of my, one of my favorite stories that I wish I had the time to tell you the whole story, but the, the, the short, short, short story of it is there was a, there was a girl in, uh, in, in Kansas City where I was before, um, sophomore girl um, who told me this, or a junior, sorry, junior girl who told me this, that as a, as a kid, <laughs> as a kid she was raped by her brother and didn't know how to function in life after that and didn't know what to do and how as a junior, she came to know Jesus, and she came to understand forgiveness, and she came to understand healing, and she actually wrote her brother a letter and mailed it to him, gave me a copy of it so I could keep, but wrote him a letter of telling him this, of how she knows Jesus now, and she understands this, and how she has forgiven him for the sins that he committed on her, um, and it's just stories like that, like one after another, of how God has worked and, and moved within lives of students, that it fills me with joy. It fills me with hope to know that God is still alive, that he's not absent. He's not gone. You can have hope uh, in Jesus because of, because of God. He, he is such a loving and good God that he fills us with hope and joy and peace. Um, and so if you ever want to hear more, uh, come find me or come find any of the, the 78 volunteers that we have, and they will be glad to tell you their story of why, why they have hope in Jesus. But uh, just to give you an idea, you know, seeing hope through the lens of youth ministry, uh, we wanted them to share that. And so thank you guys for doing that. Um, I'll let you guys go ahead and sit down because I still want to preach. Um, I want to get to a couple verses that we want to go through. Uh, so again, thank these uh, ladies for what they've done. Okay, so with that, um, I want to go ahead and have you open your Bibles or flip to this. I want to I want to get to a little bit. I want I'm going to preach super long now. If you know me, I'm kind of long winded, but I'm gonna I'm gonna plow through this sucker. We're not going to be here till noon. I promise. It's I, well, it's got two hours. I mean, we might. No, I'm kidding, Just kidding. All right, so First Peter, we're going to go to First Peter chapter three today, or chapter one. Sorry, uh, starting at verse three, uh, and this is kind of 
um, what God put on my heart this week, or this last month, really, since I'd known I was going to be up here, uh, thinking about hope and thinking about hope through youth ministry and, and kind of how this all ties together. And so God kind of led me to this direction, I, uh, and I'm really excited to, to go through this with you. So uh, I'm going to read it out of the ESV. If you have your Bible, you want to follow along, great. If you don't have your Bible, I'm going to have it on the screen. You can read with us. But first, I, w- I really want to focus on two verses, but I want to read this whole section um, because I think there's something to be said for just simply reading God's Word and just sharing God's Word and letting Him speak. Uh, and so I want to I read this section, and then we'll kind of dive in deeper on, on a couple different verses. And so if you would, uh, let, follow along with me here. Uh, it says, 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 3 through 13, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to His great mercy, He has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you, who by God's power are being guarded through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. In this you rejoice, though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been grieved by various trials, so that the tested genuineness of your faith more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Though you have not seen him, you love him. Though you do not now see him, you believe in him and rejoice with joy that is inexpressible and filled with glory, obtaining the outcome of your faith, the salvation of your souls. Concerning this salvation... The prophets who prophesied about the grace that was to be yours searched and inquired carefully, inquiring what person or time the Spirit of Christ in them was indicating when he predicted the sufferings of Christ and the subsequent glories. It was revealed to them that they were serving not themselves, but you, in the things that have now been announced to you through those who preach the good news to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven, things into which angels long to look. Therefore, preparing your minds for action, be sober-minded, set your hope fully on the grace that will be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Amen and amen and amen. Uh, So I want to focus in on two of these verses, uh, verses 3 and verses 13, kind of the the first verse verse and the last verse of this little section here, because um, I think... Uh, Peter is describing kind of what Jed says all the time that, you know, he uses that analogy of a sandwich in a lot of his stories in Mark. has a lot of sandwiches. Well, Peter does a sandwich here, too. Uh, in verse 3 and in verse 13, he talks to, he's got this idea, this theme, where he starts the book off with this theme of hope and that we want to have hope. And he mentions it in verse 3, uh, that we want to have this living hope, and in verse 13, to set our hope fully. So it's hope, lots of other stuff that describe what happens because of hope, and then verse 13, it's hope again. It's the hope sandwich. So um, we're going to look at these um, and, and kind of break these two verses down to look at and kind of understand uh, how God or how Peter is, is telling us to have this hope and how can we proceed on in hope, especially uh, which Peter was going through was a, was a very tough season and kind of like what we're going through now with a very, a very hard season. Some of you have had a very hard week. And some of you have had a very hard month. Some of you have had a very hard year. Uh, You know, 2020, I saw a thing that 2020 has been the longest five years ever, right? It's just been tough. It's been hard. Um, And it's been difficult. But through that, we can still see the good. We can still see the the positive. We can still have hope even in a tough season in life. And so uh, I wanted to explain this because... Uh, God kind of gave me an image in my mind this week. He kind of spoke to me and gave me an image in my mind to help explain these two verses. Um, that I, I, I was, once I, I kind of got that, he put that image in my mind, and then he's like, read it again. And I said, okay. And I read it again, thinking about this. And I was like, man, that just is awesome. That is incredible how those things work. And so uh, he wanted me to describe um, kind of how these two things work through the idea and the image of a battery. Okay, now... This is just a standard little old AA battery. Some of you may not be able to see it. So I brought my bigger battery with me. This is also happens to be my change jar. If you guys want to help me fill it, that would be great. 
you know, uh, we're going to pass it around. Not really, but maybe. Uh, we'll see. But anyway, this is my, uh, this is my battery. But God wanted me to think about these two verses through the idea of a battery. Um, and, and they just they fit so well. They fit so, so good together. Uh, and so I want to look at these first two words that he talks about. Uh, in verse 3, he talks about mercy. And in verse 13, he talks about grace. And if you've heard me talk about this before at youth group or here at church, I think I've preached on it before actually, but um, talking about these two words that they always kind of go together, but they're different. Uh, they're similar, but they're different. They're like two sides of a battery. One of them, uh, mercy. So let's, let's talk about mercy real quick. Mercy, uh, what is it? You know, what is mercy? What is grace? So mercy, the way that I've always described it and explain it, is that mercy is not getting what you deserve. Not getting what you deserve. And so thinking about it, you know, what is it that I deserve? What is it that I deserve? Because of my sin, I deserve punishment. I deserve death. Uh, the wages of sin is death. I deserve to die for my sins. I deserve the wrath of God. But God gives me mercy by not giving me what I deserve. Not giving me what I deserve. So this is kind of like the negative side of the battery. Uh, you know, the, 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 the negative side that is always kind of thinking about the past, thinking about the things that are bad, right? Like, the, you know, I don't want to suffer for my own sins. Like, that, that's not a pretty image there. Um, and so mercy is kind of focusing on the negative side of the battery. Now, the, they're not saying that it's a bad thing. It's a great thing. Mercy is a great thing. But it's always focused on the past. It's because of your sins that God gives you mercy. It's because of what you should deserve that God says, I'm not going to give you that. And so it's kind, of, it's kind of looking backwards. It's kind of thinking backwards to the negative side. Um, and so on the flip side of that is grace. The other side, uh, grace. So what is grace? Grace, is what I always said, is getting what you don't deserve. Getting what you don't. Not only mercy, not getting what I deserve, but grace is getting what I don't deserve. So what is that? It's always kind of looking forward. It's looking future. It's looking to the positive side of the battery, right? The positive, the good stuff, it's, it's that one day, because of God, because he's given me mercy and forgiven me of my sins, now I get to look forward to what's going to come, that I get forgiveness, I get salvation, I get to be with him forever in glory, that I get to run with Jesus, right? It's the, it's the salvation, it's the things that are coming, the things that are, that are not yet here, because we're, not, we're, not, we're still here alive in this world, but one day we will be with Jesus, one day we will get that, we will get grace we will get salvation we get forgiveness of our sins when we stand before god he's going to say you are forgiven right and so mercy is kind of the the negative side looking to what was looking at what was i i don't get what i deserve but grace on the other side of the battery is looking at what i do get getting what i don't deserve i don't for, i don't deserve to be with him forever i don't deserve forgiveness of my sins but he gives it to me anyway because he is so loving because he is so gracious. And so this is kind of the idea of, of this battery of mercy and grace. The two sides, they're not bad. They're both good, but they both work together uh, like a battery. And so looking at this uh, again, kind of looking at mercy of what do we get because of mercy? What are the results of these two words, the, of mercy and grace? So if I have mercy, what is the result of that? If I don't get what I deserve... What is the result of that? Well, Peter tells us, according to his great, great mercy, he has caused us to be born again. Because he did not give me what I deserved, that result, that caused me to be born again. And what does that mean? It means we are a new creation, a new person, that we are different. We're not the same. We are putting the past to rest. We're, we're, we're killing the past. We're burying it through baptism, the symbol of baptism, that that past is dead and gone, and, and we don't need to focus on that. In Christ, there is no condemnation for the sins that you have, that you committed, because that's gone. That's buried. It's dead. It's mercy. You, you're not, you don't have to worry about that anymore, and it's caused me to be born again, so I want to live for him. I want to do all these amazing things. I want to serve, and I want to give, and I want to do these things because of what he has done. It's caused me to be born again. I'm new. I'm different. Something's different now, right? And so the other side of that, of grace, what is the result of grace? So getting what I don't deserve, I get to have all these great things. I get to be with God forever. 
What is the result? So how do, what do I need to do because of that? I need to set my hope fully on him. I need to put my hope fully on God. Because there's a lot of things in this life that we put our hope on, that we set our hope on. Now, I love this, the, the imagery behind, in the Greek, the imagery behind this word, set your hope. It, it talks about it again in, in Hebrews. Uh, Hebrews 6, let me make sure I don't get it wrong. Hebrews 6, 19, it talks about this. It says, this hope we have as an anchor of the soul, a hope both sure and steadfast. It's the same imagery, the same language used here that we need to set our minds. It's not something that is free and loose and just blowing in the wind. It's something that is anchored, something that is secure, that is strong and steadfast, and it's going to hold, that it's not a, a hope that you have like, ah, oh, well, I mean, I don't know, I've read the Bible. I hope it's true. Man, that would be great if that's true. It's not something that you just have to be like, well, I don't know, we're going to wait and see. We're going to wait and find out. No, that's not the kind of hope that we have. That's not setting your hope. Setting your hope is like an anchor. It's, it's, it doesn't move. It's, I know no matter what's going to happen in this world, no matter how bad this year gets, I know Jesus is my hope. I am anchored in on that. That is set in stone. That is done. He is my hope. And no matter what trials I go through, like in verse 6 we talked about, that sometimes you're going to go through a season of various trials, that no matter how much trials you go through, I got my hope set. It doesn't matter how bad it gets because I'm relying on him. I'm not relying. I'm not setting my hope on my finances. They're going to fail me. I'm not setting my hope on my friends. They're going to fail me. I'm not setting my hope on, on the government. Whew, don't do that. It's going to fail you, right? If you put your hope in any, Repu- any Republican Party, any Democratic Party, they're going to fail you. It doesn't matter. If you put your hope in anything other than Jesus, it's going to fail you. But Jesus is the one that we can set our hope on, anchor it firm, that no matter what, he's not going to leave me. No matter what, he's not going to fail me. He's going to be there when it feels like everybody else has left. He's going to be there. When it feels like there is no hope, that there's nothing to look forward to, that I don't have anything to set my to look forward to in the future, the positive side of the battery. When I feel like there's no hope, I know I can set my hope fully that Jesus is true, that he is real, that he said this is true. And so I put my hope in him knowing that this is to come, that grace is coming, that I get grace, that I have mercy, that he's caused me to be born again, and I'm going to get grace one day, that I'm going to be there with him. He's going to forgive me, and I can believe it and be sure and steadfast, putting that as an anchor. So because of grace, we need to set our hope fully. No matter how bad it gets, set your hope on him, and you'll be able to survive the trials and the, and the, the hard times in life. So um, he goes on, uh, and he talks about, whoop, there we get, there we go. All right, um, so I want to kind of wrap all this up. Okay, I want to I want to try to wrap all this up and and uh, band you guys can go on and come up, um, but I want to kind of bring all this back to to mind here with an illustration, um, explaining kind of this hope that we have, how we do this, what does it look like, and I want to get very very practical because I like I like sermons that are practical. How what can I take away from this and actually do? Uh, and so I want to try to use kind of an illustration to do this, um, and I want but before we you know, to understand the illustration, i got to explain a couple more words. And so he talks about this, Peter talks about this in, in verse 3. He says that we are to be born again to a living hope. A living hope. So what is a living hope? You know, how do we, how do we have a living hope? You know, what does, that, what does that even mean? Well, thinking about it differently, thinking about it, um, how that can be you know, the, if you bring in Captain Obvious here, what is, the, what is the difference of living? What is the opposite of living? Well, it's something that is not alive, right? Captain Obvious, thank you very much. It's something that is dead. And so comparing these two things, if we want to have a living hope, then we need to have something that is alive, something that is flourishing, something that is thriving, something that is moving. If you think about the opposite of that, something that's dead, it's, not, it's something that's dormant. It's something that's it's not moving. It's not th- thriving. It's not flourishing. It's, it's stagnant, right? So what kind of hope do we have? Do we have a 
thriving hope? Do we have a flourishing hope? Do we have a, um, an active hope? Or do we have a stagnant hope, a dormant hope? Is, is our faith not going anywhere? Is it not doing anything? Is it not thriving and flourishing and moving? Or is it, is it just stagnant? Is it dormant? Is it maybe you have hope? Maybe you, well, I believe in Jesus. I know this is real, but I'm not showing it in any way. It's just inactive. My faith is just inactive. I don't, I don't know what to do about that. And so, you know, having a living hope is something that might seem like a, a weird concept, might seem like something that um, maybe you can't do, but you really can because it, there's, there's things that Peter talks about that gives us kind of the action points of what to do. How, to, how do we have this living hope? Think about this. Think about this question in your mind of, Who comes to mind when you think of somebody who has a strong faith, right? Whoever that person in your mind is, somebody who has a strong faith. Like that person, man, they have a strong faith. What is it about them that makes you think that their faith is strong? More than likely, it's because of what they do. More than likely, it's because of how they show it, how they show their faith, how they that they're, they're moving, they're, they're living, they're thriving, they're doing something. And because they're doing things, because they have action, it, you see that, and it makes you think, man, that person has a strong faith. But if you're not doing anything, if you're not moving, if you're, if you're just dormant in your faith, then you don't really have a living hope, you have a stagnant hope, you have a dormant hope. And so being active, doing things, is one of the ways that Peter tells us that we need to have a living hope. How do I do that? So verse 13, he talks about this. And he says that we should prepare our minds. So how do I have a living hope? It's simply by preparing your minds. Think about what you prepare. Everybody does this, whether you realize it or not. You prepare. Everybody this morning, well, I guess I should say most people this morning, woke up and you did what? You woke up, you... Went to the bathroom, you brushed your teeth, you got a shower, you got dressed, um, everybody got dressed, right? You prepared, you prepared for the day. You got ready for today. Most people don't just wake up and walk out the door unless you're Knox. Where did he go? I don't know where he went, right? Most people of us, we always have a plan. We, we, I mean, we have a routine that we go through. We have something that we do to prepare our, our minds, our bodies, but a lot of times, we, we prepare physically, but we don't necessarily always prepare spiritually. And, and we don't make that quite the priority. Now, I'm glad you make physical preparation a priority. I'm glad everybody gets dressed when they walk out the door. But we don't always prioritize getting prepared spiritually, preparing our minds not for inactivity, preparing our minds for action, to do something, to show a living hope that other people around you they might see you and they might say man that guy has a strong faith it's because you have a living hope it's because you've prepared for action to do something and so preparing ourselves is something that we all do we just don't necessarily always make it the priority when it comes to the spiritual side so how do we prepare spiritually there's a couple different things you can do right you can Read your Bible, you can pray, you can serve, you can give, you can, you can do all kinds of things that will help you in your faith progress and walk in your faith, right? Your spiritual walk. It's not a spiritual stand. It's a spiritual walk. It's your faith. Um, and so we do these things. We, we can do this. But if we try to start from nothing, if you have never done anything, if you're not, you're not involved in any way, shape, or form of anything of spiritual faith, you know, I don't read my Bible, I don't pray, I don't give, I don't serve, I don't do any of those things, then don't try to do it all at one time. Don't try to just say, up oh, today, that's the day, I'm jumping in, both feet, we're going all in, because that is a, it's a recipe for burnout, okay? It's a recipe for burnout. You're going to get burned out about a week in, two weeks in. But if you, if you do this like we do with everything else in life, if you take it one step at a time, and you say, you know what? I'm going to focus on Bible reading today. Or for the you know, first step, I'm going to do my. I'm going to read my Bible. I'm going to get involved, and I'm going to read my Bible. I'm going to make it a point to prepare myself in my mind 
for action, and I'm going to read my Bible. That's my first step that I'm going to do. And you do that over and over and over and over and over. And every day, it's going to feel weird, but you force yourself to do it. And you do it over and over. And then three months from now, when you've done it every day, you'll look back and you'll be like, ah, it wasn't that big of a deal. It's just part of my routine now. It's just something that I do. It doesn't feel weird, right? When JC started playing, it felt a little weird. It was different. It was music, right? And, but as we, as we went on, as we went on, you didn't notice it. As you kept going, you didn't notice it anymore until I just brought it up again. That's how it is with our faith. That's how it is in our walk. That at first, when you start to do something, it's going to feel weird. It's going to be different. It's going to stand out. But then you just keep doing it. You keep walking. You keep going. And then it just feels normal. It feels right. It's not something that's, that you feel like you have to do. And so then what happens after that is after you get the first step down and you're good on your Bible reading and it's just a normal part of your life, you take another step and then you start praying. And you're like, I'm going to keep reading my Bible because that's normal to me. But now I'm going to start praying and you add in another instrument. And it's like, it's different at first and it's weird. But then eventually it sounds right and they work together. And it's crazy how that works because you, you, you start working together. Now God gave me a, God gave me a word uh, back in January when we were doing a prayer class here at the church. Uh, and one of those prayer nights when I was sitting up here on the steps and every January I start to pray for the summer camps and I always ask God for a word. What word do you want me to have for this summer, for these, these trips? What word do you want to speak to the hearts of these kids? And every year it's something different and last year was, was the heart uh, and then this year the word was, which I thought it was for summer, little I didn't know it was for the whole year, the word that he gave me, I'm sitting there praying, God, please give me a word. And the word that pops up like a big neon sign in my mind was the word rhythm. You need to have a rhythm. What is your rhythm? That I want these students, I want you, I want everybody to have this rhythm involved in their life. A step, a walk, is something that you're doing. It's a rhythm you got. Every day you wake up, you do this. And then every day you wake up and you do this. And then every day you wake up and you do this. And it's a rhythm. And when it happens is when you have a rhythm, they all sync together and they work together. And it's not weird. But if you're off rhythm, if you're off beat, if you're chaotic, it just sounds all messed up. If you just try to force everything, it just feels wrong. It feels weird. But when you have a rhythm in your life and you try to take one step at a time, I'm going to read my Bible. I'm going to do that until it's comfortable and feels right. And then I'm going to add in another step, and I'm going to pray until that feels right. And it's just a normal part of my day where I wake up and I prepare my mind for action. And then I'm going to throw in another step, and I'm going to start giving. I'm going to give generously because God gave to me. And then I'm going to throw in another step, and I'm going to start serving because God has blessed me with so much that I want to give back. And all of these things, they just pile on top of each other, and it's a rhythm in our life that work together. And it doesn't feel weird. It, it sounds beautiful, right? But if we're off rhythm, it sounds weird. And so part of having a living hope is preparing our minds and taking one step at a time. One step at a time. Prepare your mind for action. Because you know, ultimately, where does our power come from? mercy and grace because of Jesus Christ. Because of look at the at verse 3. Living hope through who? Jesus Christ. Set your mind fully. Why? Because of the revelation of Jesus Christ. Those two things work as a battery. They go together but ultimately it's Jesus who gives us our power. And ultimately it's him that we long for, that we look for, that we set our hope on because he's the one who's going to sustain us that's going to help us have this living hope that every day I wake up, okay, Jesus, it's all about you. I'm all for you. I'm going to set my mind on you and I'm going to prepare for today so that I am willing and ready to be used however you want me to use. So set your mind on Jesus. Have a living hope and walk in a rhythm of your faith. Let me go ahead and pray and then we're going to sing a song. We're going to praise and worship together. Uh, and then after that, you guys are dismissed. Uh, we don't really have a closing. This is pretty much the closing, okay? So um, let's pray to this God who gives us our hope, our peace, and our joy.